Well, of course, we're going to have furniture during the English Renaissance. I want to introduce some of their ideas. Now, when we start out, most of the furniture is following Romanesque and Gothic, generally medieval, ideas. Most of it is going to be pragmatic. It serves a specific function. It will be beautified in some way, but never in a way that's going to interfere with its purpose. It also tends to be massive, tends to be monolithic. So what's going to change? Well, first of all, we're going to see suites and sets at this point. Now, a furniture suite is a set of furniture that goes together. For example, a dining room suite or a bedroom suite. And that can be very popular, but of course, you have to be quite wealthy to do that because it costs a considerable sum to ask a craftsman to create 24 identical chairs, for example. You can imagine what the craftsman has to go through hand carving all of this. They don't have the same machinery as we would see today. Now, let's start with construction. Starting out, they're going to deal with dark oak, which is basically any oak. It's just stained dark. And they're using oak because it is plentiful and oak is very resilient to any form of damage. You use it for ships, you can use it for massive building projects, and heaven knows the English have a lot of oak available. So they're going to use it on a regular basis for their furniture. And even when it ceases to be in style, they still use oak on a regular basis all the way up to the modern period. They will also use walnut as we move into the Jacobine. The problem with walnut is compared to oak, it's actually surprisingly soft and easy to damage. But they are taking the trend from the French and they're going to start using a lot more walnut. Now the construction method will change as well. When we enter into this period, into the Tudor period, they are mostly using board construction. In other words, massive boards put together to create a chest or any number of other things. But we see Flemish artisans and Northern European artisans coming to England and bringing with them the idea of panel construction, which we have seen so many times before. Now the advantage is if I'm using board construction, I can get a split that runs along the board, whereas with panels, that's less likely. Also with board, I have to worry about somehow adhering those boards to create a large enough piece. With panel construction, I get around a lot of that issue. Now in terms of furniture styles, of course, things change throughout the period. We tend to see, coming into the period, a very rectilinear form, a very basic form. Everything is rectangular or square. Why? Because that's the easiest shape to work with when you're working with wood furniture. After all, I can square things off pretty easily, but making curves line up, that's another matter. It tends to be heavy furniture. It tends to be fairly massive. But during the Elizabethan era and the end of the Tudor, we start to see the cup and cover or melon bulb, which is what we see here, where we have this sort of cup form. It's almost a goblet uh, with a separation and the cover. Now, the key is that separation is usually very deep. Uh, in this case, it would probably cut right into the spindle in the middle as far as they can without actually cutting through the leg. Now, of course, that will change as well. As we move into the Jacobine, we tend to see much smaller, thinner, daintier columns used uh, in place of those massive cup and, or, uh, cup and cover decorations. And this is a great way of telling what period a piece is from during the English Renaissance, because if you see that uh, melon bulb or cup and cover, it tells you immediately that it is Tudor or Elizabethan, as we move into the Jacobine, it really goes out of style. Now, one other change that happens, especially with tables, is early in the period, the Tudor specifically, we see runners that are going to be running along the floor. There might be a foot under it, but frequently they are at floor level, sometimes like a trestle table running straight through in the center. As we move into the Jacobine, they actually start to raise that runner up so that it will eventually get to the point where it's about midway up your shin if you're sitting at the table. In terms of ornamentation, things change as well. Uh, we will see 
split spindle quite commonly. Now these are lathe work spindles. They're simply split in half and applied. They give it a sense of dimension. So for example, this cupboard here, you want that dimensionality. It breaks up what is otherwise a very rectangular form with a bit of a round element. It also brings a verticality to it, giving you the sense that it's actually taller than it is. We will see a lot of carving. Now, English carving, relief carving in furniture tends to be much deeper than what we saw from the French or Northern Europeans or even the Italians, but it tends to be clumsier as well. They're getting used to this. And so we see these figures where they are partially in the round, these figures that appear to be almost glued in space here, a half man. You'll notice the half man is dressed a little different style and he's a little bit clumsy. So for example, his body is that of, you know, maybe a doll that you play with, something uh, stuffed with cotton. There's no definition to the shoulder, to the abdomen, to the arm. It's simply a cylinder and a cylinder and sort of a spheroid form. So very, very basic. But even here you can see there's our cup and cover or melon bulb design uh, developed right underneath. We will see painting and inlay. They will paint furniture, although oftentimes the paints that they're using on furniture are water-based, which is why they don't tend to last. Uh, it tends to chip off over time. You have to repaint it and repaint it. So at some point throughout the piece's history, it's often taken back to its natural wood state. We do see inlay used, as we see here. Uh, they're using import materials again. So ivory, bone, mother of pearl, things that they're getting through trade. Now during the Jacobine, we will see the addition of fringe, specifically under seats. So uh, in these two examples, we see that fringe. Now the fringe serves absolutely no purpose other than to hide the wooden frame on which you're sitting. And this sort of idea of hiding the construction is going to be important because it gives it a sense of illusion and a sense of luxury, something that we still do to this day.